Uh, ladies and gentlemen, our next speaker this afternoon is Mr Don Octoloni. He lives in um, uh, the Gippsland area of Victoria and has come over uh, with his wife Judy. Don is very active in his local community and likes to study a topical subject and understand it. And he likes to give his point of view and helps others to understand it also, which is what he's going to do today. He has kindly accepted the challenge to talk about the soil and in particular the health of the soil, which grows the food we consume and in turn helps us with our health and well-being. I'm looking forward to uh, hearing his message. Would you please welcome Don Octoloni. Mr Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, agriculture, which way forward? Now the purpose of farming is to grow food for the people who can't grow it for themselves. Now my grandfather started, tried various water-soluble fertilisers by making his sons spread these on various areas so the results could be achieved. The sons, so I'm told, used to get sick of lugging these heavy buckets around and if they'd half a chance they'd tip it down a crab hole. But they did observe that superphosphate gave a response. Now today we have large farms mostly using water-soluble fertilisers for in the production of our food. Two questions arise. Is this producing healthy food? Sorry, is this producing healthy soil? And it, is it producing healthy food? Taking the second question first, when my wife had her first colonoscopy, the surgeon said, Mrs. Octoloni, you're the last person I thought would have a problem like this. You eat so well. Now that set me thinking. I looked up the statistics from the Cancer Council. In, in new cases in 2012 were 122,093. In 2016, new cases were 130,466. Now, it was estimated in 2016 that one in two people would get cancer by their 85th birthday. Now, the deaths in 1968 were 17,032, and the deaths in 2013 were 44,108 more than double in 35 years. Now, massive amounts of money have been raised and spent on cancer research, as these men illustrate. These men uh, contributed $750,000 to the Cancer Council last year, and their regular meetings coming up have been in a few months. Now, Hippocrates, the patron saint of medicine, he stated, that let, let your food be your medicine and let your medicine be your food. Can we grow healthy food? Yes, but why don't we? The first thing we need is healthy soil, which is where Dr. Christine Jones comes into the picture. Now the following is taken from her work and Dr. Jones's website is Amazing Carbon. Now, the nutritional status of soils, plants and people has fallen dramatically in the last 50 years due to losses of soil carbon. <coughs> the key driver of soil nutrient cycles is food produced from depleted soils does not contain the essential trace minerals required for the effective functions of our immune systems. Our hospitals are overfilled with people strug and struggling with illnesses that are highly correlated to a lack of essential vitamins and trace elements in our diet. Cancer is the inability of the immune system to stop the growth of rogue cells. Now, Dr. Jones says that people have confused the wilting of rock, which is a very slow process, with the building of topsoil, which is altogether different. Now, most of the ingredients for new topsoil come from the atmosphere. That's carbon, hydrogen, and nitrogen. 
And Dr. Jones has discovered the way carbon can flow into the soil by a partnership between plants, roots, and the soil that will receive that carbon. Somewhere between 85 to 90 percent of the nutrients plants require for healthy growth are acquired via carbon exchange. That is, where plant roots exudate, that means ooze, they ooze liquid which provides energy to the microbes in order to obtain minerals and trace elements otherwise unavailable. Now, we, inadver we inadvertently blow the microbial bridge in conventional farming with high rates of synthetic fertilisers or with fungicides or other biocides. Now, there's a lot more energy generated through the biological process than the burning of fossil fuels. Most life forms get their energy directly from the sun via the process of photosynthesis. Plants are what we call autotrophs. That is, <coughs> they obtain their energy directly from the sun. Now, via the process of photosynthesis. They feed themselves by combining light energy with carbon dioxide to produce biochemical energy. As heterotrophs, we obtain energy by eating plants or by eating animals that ate plants. In effect, we're running on light energy too. Even microbes in the compost heap are obtaining energy by breaking down organic materials originating from the process of photosynthesis. Now let's look at humus. Now somebody once told me that the definition of a farmer was a handy man with a good sense of humus. <laughs> now Dr. Jones distinguishes between organic matter formed by the decomposition of carbonaceous materials and humus, which is a building up process. To get the energy that is contained in cellulose, lignans, starches, oils and waxes or other compounds formed by plants microbes have to break down this material the same as we do when we digest starches, <coughs> proteins or anything else of plant or animal origin. We breathe out more than we breathe in because we utilise the energy we obtain from the assimilation of food as cells re release carbon dioxide. Now the decomposers in the soil are doing exactly the same thing. They're breaking down organic materials and releasing carbon dioxide. Now these processes are catabolic. That means they're breaking down living tissues into simple substances or waste matter and producing energy. Conversely, the formation of humus is an anabolic process. That is a building up process. Rather than sugar being the end point, sugar is the start point. Soil microbes use sugars to create complex stable forms of carbon including humus. Humus is an organomineral complex comprising about 60% carbon, between 6 and 9% nitrogen, plus phosphorus and sulphur, and Dr. Jones has focused on a particular entity in the soil called the mycorrhizal fungi. It is an amazing thing. There is a plant and that fungi lives on the plant. Now the relationship to the amount of plant that's sitting in, up in the soil and that structure of that fungi is absolutely amazing. Now in the, in the left foreground is a a, uh, a crop of um, triticale, triticale sown by itself. Now, on the right hand side is a crop of mixed species. And you can see the advantage of using mixed species against a single uh, species. Because the, the activity in the soil is such with the mixed species that it's highly, high, much more drought proof and it's just amazing the difference with that photograph.
that's an, an example of grazing levels. If a plant is grazed to 50% of its of, of its height, that's the root depth de de depth it can have. If if it's grazed to 70%, that's the root. If it's grazed to 90%, that's the root activity that you get. So that's got implications for rotational grazing. Now, Dr. Jones has focused on this uh, mycorrhizal fungi, which has the ability to, to enable plants to photosynthesize faster than plants without this fungi. Now, such a plant can give away half its energy and still grow stronger because of the relationship with the fungi. And it doesn't cost the plant anything to photosynthesize faster. It's just using the sunlight more efficiently. Remember, plants are autotrophic and sunlight and carbon dioxide are free. So if a plant photosynthesizes faster, it's going to have to have a higher sugar content and a higher BRICS level. Now, BRICS is spelled capital B-R-I-X and BRICS is the percentage of solids in the sap of a plant. And it's measured with a gadget called a reflectometer. You can actually look through, it's a bit like looking through a telescope. Now, once the BRICS level in a plant gets over 12%, The plant is largely resistant to insects and pathogens. And BRICS plants have formed relationship with soil microbes, able to produce high levels of plant protection compounds. And in this case, the insects go away somewhere else. Now, carbon is needed for soil structure and water holding capacity. as well as feeding the microbes involved in nutri nut nutrient acquisition. Well, when soil loses carbon, it becomes hard and compacted. And the differences in infiltration of, and of moisture retention are dramatic. Now, in Australia's case, better water retention would be marvellous. An explanation of the function of the mycorrhizal fungi is in order here. It's well known that mycorrhizal fungi access and transport nutrients in exchange for the carbon from the host plant. But what is less known is that in seasonally dry, variable and unpredictable environment, that's most of Australia, mycorrhizal fungi plays an extremely important role in the plant water dynamics. The hyphal tips are hydrophilic, that means both the end of the plant and the end of the soil, enabling both water and nutrients to diffuse from one end to the other along a moisture gradient. In other words, this fungi can bring extra moisture up from the soil and it also takes the product of photosynthesis down to the, to the plant. That's it's a remarkable discovery, discovering this thing that it's part of nature. Now, the fungi can, will improve hydraulic conductivity by bridging what they call macropores in dry soils, uh, even in sand. It's, it's able to seek out the moisture in a way that other... Uh, plants without that, that don't do. It's amazing, the drought proof, and uh, I think this is one of the major things that Dr. Christine Jones has publicised personally. Now aside from, nitri from water, nitri nitrogen is frequently the most limiting factor to crop and pasture production. It's one of the great ironies of agriculture that the atmosphere is around 78% nitrogen, but there's not one single molecule directly available to plants. There are approximately 78,000 tonnes of nitrogen gas sitting on every hectare. And apart from uh, 
lightning, the only way this nitrogen, this nitrogen can't be accessed without a microbial bridge. That's an illustration of a nitro nitrogen fixing bacteria attached to a plant root. Now most nitrogen fixing bacteria, be they free living in the rhizophilia, combined to nodules on plant roots, contained in aggregates banned by the hyphal of microbial fungi, or existing in endophytes in plant leaves or stems, derive the energy from liquid carbon fixing photosynthesis. Adding water-soluble nitrogen in the form of urea, anhydrous ammonia nitrate, destabilizes the plant soil ecosystem by reducing the activity of mycorrhizal fungi and free-living nitrogen-fixing bacteria. The reference for that is Killam 1994. The pre presence of high levels of water-soluble nitrogen in soil sends a signal to plants to reduce the supply of liquid carbon to microbial symbionts, effectively inhibiting the micro microbial associations that otherwise would supply atmospheric nitrogen for free. This contradicts the widely promoted belief that nitrogenous fertilisers must be added in order for stable soil carbon to form. Indeed, the opposite is true. The reference to that is Kahn et al. 27, Larson 27, and Mulvaney et al. 29. The Chinese government recently announced a policy designed to reduce the amount of fertilisers uh, put on their soils <coughs> by 40% by 2020. That's only three years from now. And uh, Australian farmers spend something like $3 billion on nitrogenous fertilisers every year. Between 10% and 40% is of that is taken up by plants. The other 60 or 90% is leached into water, volatilised into the air or immobilised in the soil. Now, in some parts of New Zealand now, the rivers are not wadeable, less alone swimmable. And I have a cutting here from the Australian describing, it's got a picture of cows walking and uh, it's blaming the cows for the problem in the rivers. In my area, the Catchment Management Authority encouraged that all the water courses be fenced off so that the cattle can't get into them. I think they're assuming that what is troubling the water is the droppings from the cattle. But it's not that at all, it's the nitrogenous fertiliser that's put on the soil that is making the rivers unweightable, let alone unswimmable. And uh, that is a problem that got to be faced up to by, by agriculture and governments, obviously. Now, some of the uh, depletion of minerals in vegetables is interesting to observe. This is a study of mineral depletion, depletion of vegetables from 1940 to 1991. It's an average of 27 kinds of vegetables Copper has declined by 76%, calcium has declined by 46%, magnesium has declined by 24%, and potassium has declined by 16%. Now, in regard to meat, an average of 10 kinds of meat over the time, same time period, copper declined by 24%, calcium declined by 41%, and iron declined by 54%. Magnesium declined by 10% and potassium declined by 16%.
phosphorus declined by 28%. And the source of this is Thomas D.E. 20, 20, 2003. And a study of mineral depletions in food is available to us from the period 1940 to 1991, published in Nutrition and Health, 17-18-105. Now, Dr. Jones says in the interview with an American magazine called Acres, an agricultural magazine, it would require only a half a percent increase in soil carbon on 2% of our agricultural land to sequester all of Australia's carbon dioxide emissions. Now that upsets a lot of people who are panic panicking us about carbon dioxide. Now in 19, sorry, in 2009, the Portuguese government introduced a $13 million soil carbon offset scheme based on dry land pasture improvement, compliant with Article 3.4 of the Kyoto Protocol. The scheme will pay an estimated 400 participating farmers to establish biodiverse perennial mixed grass slash legume pastures, up, upwards of 20 species, to improve soil carbon and water holding capacity and livestock productivity in an area approximately 24,000 hectares. And the, the reference of that is Watson 2010. Now, the results of that policy, in addition to the carbon payments they receive, participating Portuguese farmers are reported as, quote, enjoying the environmental spin-off of greater feed for their herds in protected dry periods and better milk and meat quality. The reference again, Watson 2010. The first rule for turning this around is keep the soil covered preferably with living plants and to gradually reduce the application of water soluble fertilisers. Now Dr Jones <coughs> initiated the Australian <coughs> Soil Carbon Accreditation Scheme in 2007 in which Western Australian farmers, mostly wheat farmers, were given monetary rewards. It didn't, the money didn't come from the government, it was raised from elsewhere. But what these farmers did, they blocked off every third pipe on their drills. So they'd have two rows of wheat and leave a, a row of what was growing before, whatever it was, weeds, grass, or whatever, whatever it was. Now, you might say that sounds a bit odd. But you get the benefit of the activity in the soil in the bit of grass, weeds or whatever it was that is left to grow. And that activity is readily transported to the two rows of wheat. And this is how they got this result. Now I, I, I do this in my vegetable garden. And uh, you leave something growing row of vegetables, a, grow, a row of what was growing before, whether it's weeds or grass or whatever it is, doesn't matter. Because you've got the activity going in the soil constant, continuously. Now this is a demonstration of, of an implement they call a penetrometer. It's a probe with a spring in it and it's got a gauge and if you're trying to push that into the soil and it reads more than 20, you've got a problem with the soil. If it's under 20, well, your soil's in pretty good condition. Now, I don't know who that character is over there, but uh, our local land care group uh, bought one of these gadgets and the members are able to hire them out. Uh, Don, <coughs> you've met many people um, over a period of your life regarding soil and the practical people like Christine Jones. <clears throat> of all the knowledge in that fascinating realm called the underworld, what percentage of that activity do you think we really understand? Dr Jones has a website called Amazing Carbon 
and she's contributed many papers on that uh, website and studying those papers I mean that's that's free to anybody to look at as long as they know it's there and that's the problem mm. that often we don't know it's there but if that uh, if that website just that website was studied then there's an enormous amount of information and, and excellent information that's available to anybody who's got a computer. I'm fascinated by this gadget you've got here up on, on the screen. Can you please explain? Um, it's got penetrometer or number eight fencing wire and I look at these guys pushing the things into the ground, I suppose they're trying to penetrate it, What's the things in the bloke's hand, or the person's hand? And I can assure you, you wouldn't push that too far into the ground up at our place. It hadn't rained for six months. <laughs> <laughs> so, please. The, the gadgets there are various ends you can put onto the probe. You, can, you, you get a various size of the ends you put onto the probe that goes into the soil. I used that on my vegetable gun. I pushed it down to the handle and it didn't, didn't, didn't register anything. It was in the middle of the winter. I'd have to start with the little point. I wouldn't get anywhere else. That, that, that means your soil needs attention. <laughs> <laughs> with the last speaker, we heard of the nexus between a big business and return to shareholders and what have you now. Um, it's almost as if farmers can't believe their own eyes and trust their own intuition. Any paddock at, at, a, at a time of the year where you've got rainfall will tell you just by looking at where the grass is greenest and every, everywhere a cow's left some droppings has, looks pretty lush. <laughs> you know, it goes about a foot higher than anything else. But the next trip they go into Elders or CRT or Landmark or whatever, they'll have one of the company agronomists tell them, no, what you need is to buy this. <laughs> it comes in a bag or you can have a foliar fertiliser or something like that. So you, the bloke on the ground that's actually trying to make a quid, his own common sense is being undermined, if you like, by this push to make a buck by the fertiliser companies. And it's also to do with animal nutrition. They'll sell you any amount <laughs> of supplements to feed. So it's... It's time for a sort of a bit of a sea change in the way people think about these sorts of things, I think. People often laugh at, at, at biodynamic farming, but they've got a f some impressive runs on the board, despite what you think about um, cow horns and cow manure and doing following phases of the moon and that sort of stuff. Uh, it um, might not seem very scientific, but if the runs are on the board, <laughs> I only heard about it uh, because uh, Steve's father did a, cor did a course in, I think it was for a diploma of agriculture uh, after he retired from farming and he uh, stumbled, well I think the course mentioned Dr Jones's work and uh, because he spoke about it I st decided to, l to look into it uh, and um, but there are quite a number, like Dr. Jones is booked up for a year and a half if you wanted to speak. Really? Yeah, a year and a half. Um, we went to one of her seminars up in the Wodonga and she spoke for four hours that day. And the information that she gave that day was absolutely amazing. And um, this this was this meeting was held at what you might call a giant worm farm, where these people have uh, probably double the length of this room or more, great big hump of earth with worms, and it's all drained underneath. They produce a mixed uh, things with it and you can buy a product and put on your vegetable ground vegetable garden or you can put on a you can spray it on a farm in larger quantities if you want to but <coughs> the, 
because this lady's booked up for a year and a half, well, the word's getting around. You can't get her to speak under a year and a half. So the information is getting around. Now, re regarding biodynamics, I did biodynamics for 20 years, and <coughs> I didn't use a penetrometer to uh, assess it. I used a thistle bow. And uh, my, our, our property was uh, in three titles and, and owned by three of our relatives, and one of them didn't want me to put biodynamics on, the, on, the bit, on that bit. But the, in the middle of the summer, the hoe would try and bounce off that bit of ground, whereas in the other, it went in quite easily. Mm -hmm. So there's various versions of a penetrometer. We've got some books at home which we occasionally draw out to challenge our soil management by uh, Bill Mollison, Permaculture. And uh, I see the work of Christine Jones. I read Bill Mollison's work and I, I feel they're consistent and even complementary to each other. Do you care to comment? you like to comment on um, uh, uh, the ploughs that they use to open up soil, the uh, uh, Wallace plough, there's a, uh, another couple here on the market uh, for um, soil rejuvenation. Um, yeah, in certain cases, yes, that's, that's a good policy, that's a good policy. There's, there's another lady who lives near us, uh, whose name I can't quite remember, but I went to a presentation that she did in for the uh, Field Naturalist Club uh, not so long ago. This lady is on what they call the peat. It's, it's in, in South Gippsland. And the previous owners of this lady's land dug down 50 feet and it was still peat. It's a remarkable little piece of land. And but she was using a, a implement kind of a variation of, of the yeoman's plough, just to lift the soil up and not turn it over, to let air, to let air into the soil. And, and uh, she also used a spray, I'm not sure it was in the spray, but it was a foliage sort of a spray that she used. So we've got, we've got, we've got yeomans, we've got, well, we've got, we've got uh, Podolinsky, we've got Christian Jones, We've got a number of authorities, so we can take our pick, but they're all doing a very, a very worthwhile thing. Uh, Don, uh, just an illustration which I found very, um, and others, uh, which I found very helpful. You can go without food for a couple of weeks, you can go without water for a few days, you put a plastic bag over your head, and how long do you last without air? <laughs> Uh, there's going to be a roadblock when you're going back to Gibson if you're going back by car, Don, and I'll get to divert you down to our farm. Thank you. <laughs> Don, what about dry um, grass left on the top? I guess it all helps, but it's not quite the same as having the green grass. Well, you, you can't avoid having a, a dry period. Autumn's usually dry in Australia. You can't avoid that. But... If you've got the activity, if you've got the activity going in the soil, that will carry on through a, well, a, an extended drought. Well, it's going to be difficult, but but if the soil is um, what shall we say, it should be something like a colloid. Colloid will re, re, will retain moisture, and and if if you can keep the cover on it, that's a help even in a dry time. Um, but we know some of, our, some of Australia is really tough country to, to farm on. The farmers are keeping the stubble on the soil more so now, aren't they, rather than plough it in and that sort of thing? Which is a few in our area now are taken to using uh, liquid fertiliser like fish emulsion and liquid uh, kelp and that sort of thing. Um, do you think that's a better idea than using like the superphosphates and that? I would say it would be. I say it probably <coughs> superphosphates the worst thing to use. Okay. Thank you. Pretty hard to, not, not to improve on the worst thing. Well, Don, thank you very much for a wonderful address and I thoroughly enjoyed it and I'm uh, certain that we've all gained a lot 
from it. Thank you for studying it and looking into it and giving us all this information. So I thank Don now very much for his address.